Hello and welcome everyone to the third episode of the series on the Marxist destruction of India's history. We've been talking to Sandeep Balakrishna over this fascinating uh, period of hist historians and how history writing emerged. And in the last episode, as some of you who have watched may remember, we reached a stage where Sandeep brought us to a point in time in history where two schools or two competing streams of history writing had emerged. Uh, one could call them nationalists versus the Marxists. And that is where we stopped the last uh, episode. So in this episode, uh, our endeavor would be to talk to Sandeep on what happened hereafter on how did these two streams continue, how did one come to dominate the other and we'll take it from there on. In fact, a lot of you have been asking for this part. So in this episode, Sandeep shall uh, talk about this part in greater detail. So with that, let's get started talking to Sandeep. Thank you all for joining us again. So hi Sandeep, uh, we are back here for continuing the conversation on this mega series on the destruction of history by Marxists. You had got us to a stage where we saw two streams of history writing emerge, two competing streams, nationalists and the Marxists. And as a lot of us popularly know, Marxists went on to dominate history writing. So could you talk to us about what happened after that in stages? And then we'll get to some of the details <coughs> as you uh, talk us through that. Sure, Parag, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we've gone through the responses for uh, the preceding, you know, uh, two episodes on this mega series on uh, the destruction of history writing <coughs> in India. And uh, I think we stopped at uh, uh, the stage where <coughs> Marxists began to slowly capture uh, various educational uh, uh, institutions and primarily the uh, so-called history establishment. Now, you know, just to fast forward uh, to the years after India attained independence and I think we have spoken about, uh, uh, you know, how uh, uh, R.C. Majumdar's proposal to write the comprehensive history of the Indian freedom struggle was uh, subverted and then botched up by, uh, you know, cronies of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. Correction, uh, Nawab Nehru. Nawab Nehru. <laughs> so, after that, thanks to Nawab Nehru's fondness for Marxism, and I think I mentioned this, that uh, Nawab Nehru learned his history lessons by sitting at the feet of Muhammad Habib, about which we have, you know, also described his record, <clears throat> his, his credentials as a uh, scholar of Indian history, especially uh, the so-called uh, Muslim period of Indian history. Plus, Nehru's uh, addiction for communism and how he was uh, addicted to Russia and then packed, uh, uh, you know, his uh, uh, closest circles with all kinds of Marxists. Now, several developments kept happening uh, simultaneously during that period, especially after Nawab Nehru became the, uh, you know, unchallengeable uh, uh, leader, both within the Congress party and in the government. His first uh, education minister, rather India's first education minister, Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad. So, he was a Maulana. So, the word Maulana is a technical term in the, uh, you know, which, uh, which denotes a Maulana is basically a member of the Islamic clergy who is well versed in the Islamic scriptures. So, this is a man who became India's first education minister and, you know, he had a big hand in subverting uh, uh, history writing in India. So, uh, mm. is there any background or context you can give mm. us on mm. why was he chosen as education minister versus anybody else that was available? There is no, you know, specific reason. Mm. You know, after Nawab Nehru became PM, uh, we really don't know the rationale for the allocation of portfolios. portfolios. Okay. So, that part uh, is unclear. Maybe, you know, these reasons, uh, uh, if you look at, say, constituent assembly debates or uh, things of that time, other other documents of that time, maybe you might find a reason. But okay. I see no rationale for uh, allocating these portfolios. Am Ambedkar, for example, classic case. He writes himself, uh, rather, in his resignation speech on the floor of the Lok Sabha. So he basically says that I was, you know, thoroughly surprised when I got the invitation from Nawab Nehru uh, to become the law minister of India. I of all people who had never seen eye to eye with the top leadership of the Congress party, including uh, Mohandas Gandhi, uh, Nehru and, you know, that that group. 
So he says, I'm surprised. He was, take, he was taken aback. Actually. Yeah, he was taken aback. But he said, you know, I nevertheless uh, less accepted it because I saw it as, uh, you know, an opportunity to do uh, service to this nation, which I've always done. This was his rationale. So he also makes a very, uh, uh, you know, pointed uh, reference to the ad hoc manner in which decisions were taken by various committees in the, uh, you know, cabinet <coughs> and, you know, other, other departments. So, uh, as far as my knowledge goes, I see no logical, uh, uh, you know, reason behind the selection of certain uh, people and awarding them whatever portfolios. So, I guess, you know, Azad was uh, selected on, I don't know, his proximity to Nehru is uh, well known. So, he was, he professed great admiration for, uh, uh, you know, Nawab Nehru, but uh, M.O. Mathai, who was uh, Nawab Nehru's uh, personal secretary or private secretary, he has written a two-part uh, memoirs, a very scathing account. Yes, yes. Uh, what, what he pretty much strips apart uh, a lot of uh, uh, people that we used to regard as great leaders and, you know, uh, uh, diplomats and ministers and, you know, other people of eminence. So, he quotes Nawab Nehru, uh, men, you know, describing Maulana Azad. And I'm paraphrasing uh, Mathai's words, uh, uh, who said, uh, you know, who basically said that Nehru told his uh, cabinet colleagues and other people in his close circle that no self-respecting congressman will visit the Maulana's house after 5 p.m. Well, well. I mean, economy of words, but point well made. <laughs> So, you know, these things are all... He's also written about uh, Indira Gandhi, Who? the same memoir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. same, so same, same, yeah same, same Mathai, same, same gentleman. Yeah. So, the chapter is called She. Yeah, yeah. Best not, uh, which no, is, we, yeah, should, yeah. We, we shouldn't get into those details. Get into, yeah, exactly. So, this was Maulana. And he became India's uh, education minister. And we can hazard a guess based on, you know, uh, these facts. That he got the education portfolio primarily based on his proximity to Nehru. So, that is the conjecture that we can, you know, reasonably make. Understood. And that set in motion, uh, you know, a long chain of events, uh, which basically caused the destruction of Indian history. If he was not there, if someone like K. M. Munshi was there as India's education minister, things would have been vastly different as far as history writing is concerned and therefore our, the future of our country was concerned. Future as in, in the past tense. And uh, Maulana cultivated his favourites, obviously. One of them was a gentleman named Humayun Kabir. Uh, I think he came from the bureaucracy or he was also a politician, I'm not sure. He was a distinguished Urdu poet and he's got a lot of uh, uh, awards and things, honours in his name. So, Humayun Kabir sat at the feet of Maulana uh, Azad, who dictated his autobiography to this man. Okay. And Kabir also became MOS for education minister or, or, or uh, he himself became the central minister for education. Kabir himself. Kabir himself. Okay. Yeah. I could be uh, mistaken about the slight technical details, but he had a big role to play in the education <coughs> establishment. So, the first... Uh, four or five education ministers of India were all Muslim. First five? First four or five. Okay, that's, that, that, that's, that is very telling. That, yeah. that is very telling. Now, so this is one track. The second track was the infiltration of the communists and the Marxists. You know, they're all cut from the same cloth. Right. I don't make much of a, uh, you know, distinction between who is a socialist, who is a communist and who is a Marxist. Because these are all theory masters and they pretty much work as far as Indian context is concerned. Uh, all of them come armed with this infallible, indestructible, timeless theory, uh, you know, which has practical implications in the form of uh, uh, what, what they used to call as agit prop. Agit prop is a portmanteau of agitation and propaganda. So what they wrote in the name of his Indian history was propaganda. How they achieved this propaganda in concrete terms was through agitation. 
So we see remnants of that in the. We see this throughout mm. in the last 70, 75 years. You know their methods and you know uh, things like that. And the way the Marxists have always worked, be it Russia, China, everywhere, is to capture institutions. Because once you capture institutions and you pack them with your favorites, with your fellow travelers, with your compatriots, with your comrades, then it doesn't matter and you stay there for a long enough time, then it doesn't matter which political party comes to power. You're entrenched by that. You're entrenched by that. And the big power that institutional capture gives you is the ability and the influence to shape to make or break careers. So you take a fresh graduate from school or uh, from college, a university student, a grad, someone who wants to do, uh, uh, you know, postgraduate or PhD or whatever. You give them a career path and that career path will be scripted, produced and directed by you. You essentially hold their entire future in, their, in, in your hands. So this has been the so method. So they tow the line no. and if otherwise there are pen yeah. penalties. I'll give you several examples as we, you know, uh, go along. <clears throat> now, it might surprise you that, you know, initially when these Marxists, you know, began to uh, penetrate uh, these institutions with the goal of subverting and then finally uh, monopolizing them, there were all these stalwarts still alive. Jadunath Sarkar was still alive. R.C. Majumdar was still alive. He passed away in 1980 or 81, yeah. At a ripe age of 90 plus, he lived a full life. So, some of these stalwarts were still, uh, uh, you know, around. And these Marxists, they had no real scholarship. For them, you know, we have discussed this uh, in the previous episodes. <laughs> For them, be it art, culture or history, everything is a means uh, to achieve a Marxist utopia. Right. So they had the theory and they force fitted all the recorded facts of history, truths of history in so that they would conform to this Marxist theory. If it didn't conform, then you either reject it or, uh, you know, you whitewash it as a case may be. So this was the uh, standard tactic. And all these stalwarts who were already there in the institution, uh, uh, institutions like ICHR, there was a great body called the Indian uh, Historical Records Commission. So th they were all manned by these uh, uh, luminaries of the modern Indian Renaissance. So they were either on the verge of retirement or, uh, or they had already retired. And they did not fathom that a pure discipline, a sacred calling like history, could be used to do political propaganda. propaganda. So this was their greatest failing in a way. Which is where they ceded ground because they did not uh, really... No, they didn't actually cede ground in that okay, sense. in the natural no, exit. It, no, it was not even in their wildest conception that a subject like history, like I said, a quest for truth, could even be used like this. Yeah, with political objectives. Ha. Okay. So this didn't even occur to them. Most of them. I'm not generalizing, but most hmm. of them. And, you know, uh, once their term was over and, you know, they passed away, uh, you know, they died and all that, these Marxists, they began to slowly infiltrate existing institutions. And uh, I had a long uh, interview with a very distinguished uh, scholar uh, of Marxism, of especially of Indian uh, communism and Marxism, Dr. Shankar Sharan, okay. uh, a very, uh, you know, very erudite man. So, I asked him the same question, ki how did this institutional control and capture, you know, happen? He said, you might be surprised to know, Sandeep, that they had it easy. The Marxists met with no opposition in the initial stages. This, there was no resistance? There was no resistance at all. Because, like I said, all these, uh, you know, genuine historians did not suspect their motives. Motives. You mentioned that l last time also to my question. Exactly. Okay, so it was a natural it was coming a cake in. It was in a Without sense. realizing mm. that these are all Trojans with Absolutely. biggest intent. Absolutely. So, it was a cakewalk. So, in the first stage, uh, they infiltrated the existing institutions which, it, which had been set up, you know, during the colonial British regime. And in the second stage, 
the Marxists themselves began to create new institutions which were exclusively modeled on, you know, their ideology. For instance, uh, I'll come to that later. Now, we are on the, we are in the first stage. After subverting, infiltrating all these institutions, they brought in this, uh, whatever, Allahabad school of history writing, alleged history writing, and the Aligarh school of alleged history writing, pioneered by the great Muhammad Habib and, you know, uh, people of his uh, nature. After that, what systematically began to happen was that this narrative of whitewashing the dark record of medieval Muslim rule in India was given a systematic and a definite shape. And with that, we come to the second stage, which uh, coincided it didn't coincide, uh, no, it didn't coincide, but it was an organic outgrowth of Srimati Indira Gandhi, who split the Congress party. Uh, you know, we can do a separate episode on, you know, the co long-term consequences of uh, Indira Gandhi splitting the Congress party in, in 1969 or 67. Uh, but the far-reaching consequences of her splitting that, we are still suffering in every walk of our national life. We are actually bearing the, you know, brunt of, uh, brunt of what she did back then with the sole purpose of, you know, retaining and holding on to political power for eternity. So that was the sole intent. And after she split the party, she relied on the support of communists to back her prime ministership, which they gave. In return, they asked the full control of the educational establishment. This story pretty much most people know. And as a result of that, and she gave the, you know, she gave them their pound of flesh. And after that, two or three major institutions were uh, uh, founded by the communists with her support, which the funded by Indian taxpayer money. <coughs> First was the establishment of the Jawaharlal Nehru University, oh, okay. which was called <clears throat> until recently the Mecca of Marxism. The second was the establishment of a body called the Indian Council for Historical Research or ICHR. ICHR. The amount of damage that these two institutions have done is incalculable. All right. Now, before that, the Marxists, when they infiltrated, you know, existing institutions, they took over something called the NCERT, which is a body, uh, you know, appointed to write history textbooks. Yeah, we've grown textbooks. up reading NCERT. We know books, that. Yes, and then another, an even more powerful body, not too many people know that such a body exists in India. It was called the NIEP, National Institute for Educational Planning. Okay. NIEP. NIEP. Okay. Okay. It's an extremely powerful body. Used to be. Now I don't know, you know, where it is in the hierarchy, but, uh, you know, it used to be one of the most decisive and powerful bodies for the longest time during uh, uh, Congress and, and Congress allied, uh, you know, regimes. So, in 1972, JNU was founded. And at that time, Indira Gandhi appointed a man named Nurul Hassan, Sayyid Nurul Hassan, as her educational minister. This guy, he swore undying loyalty to Marxism. All right, but you know, deep down, he was cut from the same cloth as, say, Maulana Azad or you know, other eminences of that sort. One of the first things he did after becoming educational uh, minister of education was to give a blank check to all Marxists to, you know, run their agenda in JNU, Aligarh Muslim University, NCERT, NIEP and other bodies in charge of India's education, meaning the education that you and I have received. Have received. So, Sunny, uh, before you, uh, you know, we continue with this, mm. what I wanted to check with you was that in... Uh, 
what was the motivation of the marxist to whitewash uh, the brutality of islamic invaders because mm-hmm. the directive came from the education ministers who happened to have a particular religious lineage mm-hmm. uh yes and not just one mm-hmm. uh not you can't peg it down to just one uh, factor mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. there are multiple factors but mm-hmm. i'll come down i'll come to that later let me finish this mm-hmm. uh, this part about uh, jnu and uh, uh, ncert now Nurul Hasan's uh, uh, deputy loyalist was a man named uh, H S Khan. H S Khan. H S Khan. Okay. So he worked as the director or the head of the history de- history and sociology department at N C R T for twenty years. <laughs> Two decades. Two decades. Close to Nurul Hasan, mm. and this man actually wrote. and proclaimed that india civilization was brought to india after the introduction of islam in this country so india got civilized yes only after islam only came. after islam came here he believed in it and this is through ncert through ncert and in 1986 all right he issued this khan gentleman issued a circular to all state uh, education departments of all states in india to rewrite the history textbooks you know so that uh, uh, you know they read along familiar lines what you just mentioned about whitewashing islamic atrocities and uh, uh, you know downplaying uh, hindu achievements so one of the guidelines in that uh, circular was to say that there was no such thing as a golden age of hindu civilization you know it is widely recognized even today for any objective uh, study of uh, indian history shows that the golden age of indian civilization occurred during the regime of the gupta empire every practice you know be it in the field in the realm of culture art music dance sculpture our belief systems our puja paddhatis all these things were given a concrete shape during the gupta period most of the festivals that we celebrate i mean the methods might be different in you know the way you perform say <clears throat> ram navmi at your home and the way we do here but in my house but but when you trace their roots back it goes back to the gupta period that was when the puranas were concretized that was the age of kalidasa so it was truly the golden age of uh, uh, hindu civilization now because you cannot ignore this and there are copious records which cannot be falsified which testify that indeed the gupta age was india's golden age you can't falsify that so because you can't do that the evidence is so overwhelming you issue a blanket directive stating that the concept of something called a golden age does not exist at all <laughs> all right so this was you no know, the look at the levels of insidiousness that you know the lens that they've gone to do all this so that 1986 circular still forms the basis now i don't know you know what changes the government has <coughs> made in the last 10 years but for since 1986 onwards till even at least 2014 you know that set the template in many ways for the rampant and prolific distortions of indian history so uh marxist correct me if i'm wrong mm-hmm. uh, theoretically or otherwise the belief system is they're atheists they don't believe mm-hmm. in god mm-hmm. so for marxist to do the bidding of whitewashing mm-hmm. islamic invasion mm. and uh, denying mm. the richness of hindu civilization mm. it's like one religion versus the other so mm. why did they choose to do that again was it at the okay br- okay it's a fantastic question now as far as indian marxists are concerned i i, I don't mind repeating this uh, you know what i s- spoke in the earlier uh, episodes as far as indian marxists are concerned they have always been the voice of alien communist nations ussr and china not so much china as far as indian history is concerned but soviet russia so soviet russia would give them a line ki you know 
project Indian history like this and so that you know our communist utopia India will also become uh, you know okay. a communist country like USSR. So our Marxists would take the cue and ransack history textbooks and find out episodes and incidents and events that would somehow fit into this Marxist narrative. Okay. All right. Mm. Now, as far as India is concerned, they encountered their, their biggest obstacle in the form of Hindu civilization, its antiquity, its continuity, its cultural richness, its diversity, and, <coughs> and its the strength of its uh, society. Now, this is a very, very decentralized society. But underlying all this is a strand of unity, cultural unity. I mean, I've mentioned this several yes, times. and which is what yeah. has made it survive and grow. Correct. So, because it's decentralized, there's no one book, you know, there's no one shrine or one, one, one building. You break it down and the whole thing collapses. Scatters, yeah. Alright, so that, and there is a self-correcting mechanism. Because time is not a constant, it keeps changing. Uh, you know, it is cyclic. You know, what goes up should come down, all these things. And when certain undesirable elements crept into Hindu society from time to time, our own society, its fundamentals, threw up leaders, reformers and great men who corrected this society, showed the path from within. within. So we never, here is the thing Parab, it's a very, very, uh, uh, you know, handy formula. Of all the alien faiths and cults and sects and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, other things that came outside into India, which were not based on, one, uh, on Indian soil, which did not grow here, none of these cults or sects or religions, none of them till date, have made any impact on the philosophical core of all the schools and philosophies born here. It's so well said. I mean, so I think that's the beauty and the strength of Sanatana Dharma, right? Right. Show me that. So what this brings us to uh, another point is that unfortunately, there are two parallel tracks which should have met in, in, in our uh, overall civilizational uh, uh, context, two parallel tracks, the spiritual history of India and the political history of India. They are not only parallel tracks, but after British colonization, they were recast as opposing tracks. The maximum amount of distortions, uh, ill-informed narratives you find in the political and social history of India. The spiritual history of India has remained intact, accurate till date. And not being corrupted at not all. Not being corrupted at all. And that perhaps has been the bulwark against whatever exactly. political Exactly. So this spiritual was. history of India is the basis to understand the political and social history of India. This has been divorced. Not only divorced, they have been set up, set up as mutually opposing camps. And and therefore, the current argument is that we believe only in the constitution mm. is to negate this entire spiritual history. Precisely. Well said. Now, coming back to your point. So, this is what the Marxists encountered. Now, here's the thing. Both capitalism, Marxism, communism, all these things, they're all isms. And I'll say that every ism is a prison. <laughs> okay. All right. You look. The Westerners say that man is born free, and this is what Marx and Engels said. Man is born in man is born free, but everywhere he is in fetters and things like that. The re real freedom is spiritual freedom, which is what Sanatana Dharma and all its offshoots guarantee us. Guarantee us. Which is why there is no concept of conversion. We believe in the eternal karma life cycle, right? Which is so, so this, uh, this, this, this knowledge, this awareness came naturally to us. But thanks to all these, now how do you take, how do you understand such a civilization, such as philosophy, such a, a society based on, you know, these foundations using a, a, a millenarian ideology like Marxism, which divides the world into, you know, binaries, 
capitalist, communist, oppressor, oppressed. Very nice to have these <coughs> you know, clear cut divides, opposing divides. Now, you, this is your framework to study a spiritual civilization like this. So, this is where the Marxists encountered their biggest obstacle. The Hindu society, its philosophical, Vedantic, spiritual foundations. So, because you can't counter materialist ideology like, you know, uh, like Marxism, cannot counter this, this level of profound philosophy. So, how do you dismantle it? And it is the biggest obstacle. You take the case of, say, Soviet Russia. The society was pretty much pre-Marxist, pre-communist Russia, was pretty much homogeneous. It was a Christian society, orthodox Russian Christianity, Christian society, essentially. There was few, if no, elements of what they call as paganism. So, it was quite easy for this kind of violent Marxist revolution to, you know, take root there. Same goes more or less with uh, uh, China, but I mean that, that argument is slightly complex. But anyway, it was pretty much a homogeneous society. But here, who were the Marxists, who, you know, uh, Indian Marxists and communists, who tried to implement or bring about a Marxist revolution in India? Majority of them were Hindus. They were all Hindus, actually. Yeah, and... Even within that, majority of them were Brahmins. We will come to that later. Uh, we will do a separate series on Indian Marxists. But when they studied this, this society, they found that, you know, this could not be uh, dismantled to bring in a total communist revolution. So, because Sanatana Dharma and its society, its social harmony was a great hurdle, they set about dismantling Sanatana Dharma by distorting its history and uh, uh, splintering its society. And that path had already been carved out by the colonial British who took the Hindu society as a whole, not just society, who took India as a whole, cut it up into neat little slices and studied each slice as a, as, as, as a uh, as a scientist studies a lab rat or something and then find out ways to you know pit the society against itself so that they could hold on to their colonial rule. So this the British did and the Marxists faithfully copied that but they took it to a completely different level and if you want to destroy the society one thing like I said agit prop one thing is to stoke passions that, you know, look, you have been oppressed from uh, uh, 800 years, 5000 years. Uh, Create these, a victimhood uh, complex. Uh, uh, victimhood complex. These people, uh, 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 you know, denied you education. This, this is one narrative. And, uh, you know, that is at the ground level. You know, burn bridges and blow up railway tracks. That is on the ground level. That is the agitation level. And on the propaganda level, you write the same thing in textbooks, in your plays and uh, dramas and cinema and poetry and this kind of uh, thing. And in that project, they were not only helped by the British who had supplied them with this kind of raw material, they were also helped by a big section of the Islamists, uh, particularly the Aligarh school, the early proponents of the Muslim League, all these people, right, Muhammad Habib, uh, Alama Iqbal, Syed Ahmad Khan and, and, and their intellectual progeny. So, these guys got in bed together. So, for what Marxists thought that they were using Islamists. In fact, uh, the Islamists, mean, mainly the Ashraf elite from Western UP, the holdovers of uh, the Mughal Empire, the former Mughal elite, they were the best friends with British. They saw British as the saviors and British in you terms, mentioned last time, yeah, yeah. Molly coddled them saying that we are your protectors against this tyrannical <coughs> majority of Hindus and you know, things like that. So, these guys formed an unholy alliance, the communists, Marxists and the Islamists. They thought they would be using each other to, you know, the Marxists thought they would even, their revolution would eventually triumph and the Islamists thought that we would get Pakistan and, you know, uh, which was, which is described as the unfinished Mughal dream. 
So they were working, you know, towards their own selfish ends, but you know, they put 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 forward a united front against their common enemy, which is the Hindu society, culture, civilization. So this entailed distortions and whitewashing on an industrial, on an epic scale. Does this answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah. And all this when Nawab Nehru hmm. presided over all of this in the initial years. He didn't uh, directly preside over, uh, you know, yeah, these distortions, his, no. but uh, he did not even think, look, if you are educated by someone like Muhammad Habib. And then you won't see any aberration. You won't all. see any aberration. You will yeah. think that, you know, this is the real history of India. Yeah. Understood. So, in one public speech in Bombay, he said that right-wing Hindu communalism, whatever that means, is the greatest threat to India's unity. Yes, I remember reading that. And he also spoke about his understanding of Hinduism, Hindu dharma, is that Today, and this is again in a public speech. Today, your Hindu dharma has become a thing about what you can or cannot cook in your kitchen and what you can or you cannot eat. This is his understanding of Sanatana dharma. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it is but natural, but logical that, you know, he patronized the kind of uh, historians, alleged historians that he did. In his view, and he's recorded these, I mean, one you have to give to the man's honesty, you know, put this in black and white speeches, writings and things like that. In one place, he says that M. N. Roy was the greatest living intellectual in India. <laughs> the same M. N. Roy who was trained by Soviet Russia, the same M. N. Roy who received 12,000 rupees from the British, uh, from the Soviets, in uh, one bank account in, I think, in Delhi and in one bank account in Shimla to sabotage the Quit India movement, to carry on the communist agenda. So he is regarded, but none, none less, none other than the Prime Minister of India as the greatest living uh, intellectual in India. So it's quite natural. Now let's come back to, uh, what is this, NCERT uh, things. So establishment of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, ICHR, all these things and you know, people like H.S. Khan who uh, pretty much wrote or rewrote uh, history textbooks at the level of the school level. So like they say, you know, in one place I think long back had written that, uh, you know, you might have the history establishment, the Hindus might have the history establishment in their control now, but the communists have our children. Yes, yes. And that's where the indoctrination and, begins. And, and they captured the, our children long back, long back, more than 60 years back. And I think the work uh, trend that we're seeing is yeah, perhaps is a result outgrowth, of that. It yes. is an outgrowth of yeah. that. Old wine in new bottle, but this time, you know, that this woke incarnation is terrible. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's fatal, fatal if, it is not, if it is not stopped. So, yeah, that was uh, uh, one. And the raw material for NCRT for... Uh, textbook, school textbooks. The raw material was provided by the alleged scholarship in history done by the school of Muhammad Habib, Satish Chandra, Muhammad Habib's son, Irfan Habib, Romila Tapar, this, this gang of yeah. uh, usual suspects. And scholarship becomes the raw material for what is known as popular narratives. Popular narrative includes a lot of things uh, such as, you know, what we, slogans that we take for granted, pronouncements, generalizations that we take for granted. All this, like, let's take a random example, make love, not war. <laughs> All right. This you is a lyric very, of yeah. a song by Bob Marley. It yeah. came out in 1973. You might be surprised to learn that this formulation, make love, not war, is the indirect result of the scholarship done by a far left uh, institution called the Frankfurt School. So it stemmed, it originated from there? Okay. So this is how, you know, scholarship becomes raw material and then finds its way into popular culture. In this case through music. Uh, through music. Now other examples of pop popular culture. Bindi is regressive. Mangal Sutra is a sign of slavery. A systematic planned assault. Right. 
you don't question these they have become received wisdom not settled truths they have become received wisdom but where is the raw material for this it all starts there it, so this is a formulation this all this you know bindi and uh, raw material it is a direct uh, outcome of a marxist narrative which which based on no evidence declared long back that hindu society by its nature is regressive so everything associated with it is regressive so induce self loathing yes. and and yeah. completely erase any association Ira yes. of the past spiritual yeah. continuity yes so what what <clears throat> now bindi and you know uh, mangal sutra and your uh, touring all these things they are considered as sacred so the first thing you see the links you know where all these things uh, you know you know how these things are interconnected all these things are mangala sutra mangala is auspicious auspicious right it's not just sutra sutra means thread so this is no ordinary thread so what is the link when you demonize it what you're doing is you're destroying sanctity sanctity cannot be quantified sanctity cannot be documented but it is there it's a belief it is there no it is not a belief it is there it goes it comes from a place which is far more profound than mere belief actually sorry yeah all right yeah so it goes all the way back sanctity goes all the way back to a spiritual longing which is innate in all human beings so how how does this link uh, no where uh, you know where where is this link to remember what i spoke about uh, a completely atheistic uh, ideology like marxism which is incapable of studying a spiritual culture and society yes. like sanatana dharma Sadarva. so in order to destroy it you cannot disprove it in order to destroy it you destroy its sanctity which is what the game plan this was. is what the thing is so from this from an inability to understand because you don't have tools to understand this it's understanding is a function of the brain and the intellect these things the foundations of sanatana dharma transcend the intellect that is where your sanctity lies notions of sanctity and purity that is where they lie so how to destroy to destroy it like this by destroying the very notion of sanctity by dragging by dismissing sanctity that you know because you can't counter this you know on the plane of the intellect so dismiss it because you can't counter it intellectually dismiss it say that it doesn't exist it's like dismissing air because you can't see it but without it you can't breathe so one must give it to them they you have to give it to them and they could do this precisely because they understood that the way of you know altering several generations is through institutional capture otherwise they couldn't have succeeded on this fabulous skill so uh, the best way they obviously realized and very smartly realized that they could alter generations through institutional capture mm -hmm. which is what you mentioned so uh, once they started capturing ncrt niep you mentioned that's a body not many people know about mm. how did they go about from there on mm. for example could you give us a view on what did they alter and what damage it has caused for generations whether it is hmm. not necessarily by historian but hmm. essentially how hmm. the damage started from there on ah uh, this itself can you know spill over into the next episode but uh, here's a formulation because we are on the topic of you know restricting the series to institutional capture of uh, indian history and its distortion <coughs> two devices the first again seeded by mohammad habib who basically whitewashed islamic uh, atrocities uh, into india you know industrial scale destruction of hindu temples uh, epic cow slaughter slave taking this kind of thing he delinked it from the tenets which motivated all these alien invaders to destroy temples he delinked it and recast it in economic terms all right so that is whitewashing the brutal uh, record of uh, islamic invasions the second 
was to deny agency to Hindus, to Hindu society to tell their own story, be it the story of their glory or the triumph, which I think or, is or the story of their tragedies and their suffering. Yeah, this denying the agency is really, really hurts. Yeah, yeah. so this is a two-pronged approach and, you know, like you said, you have to look at their, you know, admire their foresight and their vision as to, you know, they thought in terms of outcomes. The Marxists thought that by doing this, by distorting history in this fashion and at, at multiple levels, by doing that, they thought that they would convert all Hindus into becoming Marxists. Whereas the Islamists thought that by doing the same thing, they would perpetuate the unfinished Mughal dream and to erase uh, the guilt, <coughs> the record that that community was responsible for the partition of India. And thankfully, both these failed. Yeah, both these have failed. Thanks, you know, no thanks to Marxists, but no thanks, thanks to the resilience of the Hindu society. And the spiritual and the spiritual civilization. Yeah. Okay, so this, this was the device these uh, uh, fellows used. And uh, the short, while in the long run they haven't succeeded so far, the short term damage has been enormous. enormous. One thing is that it has cut off the Hindu society, especially uh, the so-called uh, uh, English educated Hindu society from its roots. That process began with the British, but like I said, the Marxists took it over to a different level. You know, they made large, they made at least three, two and a half, three generations of Hindus, uh, uh, not only ashamed, but to hate themselves. The self-loathing was induced. Self-loathing was induced in the Hindu society. Uh, it's a pretty tragic in that Classic sense. Ones, yeah. uh, so that, that and like I said, you know, institutional capture and rigging of uh, uh, textbooks and you know, I call the Marxist history establishment as a ordinance, national ordinance factory that produces traitors. National ordinance factory that, that produces, produces traitors. traitors. This is what it is. So look at all those people. I mean, look at them. Otherwise. Innocent. I mean, every child, like they say, is a blank slate. What do you write on it? This? Indoctrination. Indoctrination. So these people, all the so-called Marxist academics, who is an academic? He is also a teacher, no? A teacher in our tradition, what is a, yeah, a guru. You know, standard accorded, what is a reverence accorded to a teacher? That they shape the national nation's future. They preserve the culture intact. What is what have these people done sitting in such responsible positions? You put this argument, you put this argument to a Marxist teacher. They will say that, you know, this itself, the notion that a teacher is a guru, as a molder, this itself is communal. This itself is regressive. Oh God. How do you argue with this? What is regressive? Anyway, that's... Uh, I think. No, that's, I mean, there's no logical basis, Understood. but, you know... The, when you come <coughs> armed with this kind of a mindset, which is why no Marxist will ever enter into a logical argument based on facts. All right? They have theory. We have facts. <laughs> so this this has been uh, par for the course. So and children uh, have been used as fodder. Totally, to cannon fodder. Totally. So, you know, they turn against their own parents no, yeah, without, yeah, their, seen, without realizing. Yeah, yeah, on X, there are several such examples. Yeah, yeah. Where children... And, like, and, and you can't convince them. They're beyond that. They have been, uh, you know, they have been injected with immunity. A lifelong vaccine has been given against logic, common sense and truth and decency. And complete deracination. Complete deracination. It this is, is this is a work of teachers. You know, uske hath mein gun thama do, send them into jungles. All these fellows, no, Varavara Rao, mm. Gadar, all these fellows, they are, you know, technically speaking, they are educated. Meaning they know how to read and write and, you know, articulate. In that position, they have gun thama de, they have turned them into, you know, soldiers fighting war against their own country. Yeah. In the name of revolution. You know so, what? 
in the marxist universe theoretical universe india's independence is recast as a betrayal of revolution delusional or no serious no no what drives this i mean uh, betrayal of revolution there was no revolution revolutionary roots i mean given india's past of this kind no betrayal of marxist revolution sir they the marxists were against india's revolution i mean india's freedom freedom okay so that itself was an no, act of betrayal there you go okay so with this kind of a mindset what is the kind of textbooks they write yeah the whole philosophy of overthrowing an elected legitimate government yeah, yeah. by uh, by arms through violence through violence itself yeah. is uh, yeah. has no place so that that is the root of this you know uh, this kind of ideology and you know they were at every point when it was convenient to them they <coughs> took money from the british on the side when the you know again the line came from russia they took money from so all the queues came from russia queue, yeah. so these fellows are not terribly known for their originality all right so they took money from russia to sabotage the indian freedom struggle they took money from the british to sabotage you know uh, you know congress agitations so no value to system at all no value system at all i mean you can fight with a battle with known rules these fellows make up rules as they go along <laughs> how do you deal with this so all these history textbooks are part they are lessons in conducting marxist warfare at multiple levels that's what it is so this is why you need to distort our history lessons and uh, you know some of the most uh, egregious and well known distortions were done by uh, the usual suspects if you disregard mohammad habib you come all the way to you know romila thapar bipan chandra satish chandra uh, romila thapar irfan habib rs sharma hardcore communists but masquerading as historians and you know they appoint give labels to themselves so you know this self certification they are damn good at that okay ek parag so would you, you give the honor of adding ramchandra guha to this list he also gives he labels to himself yeah yeah he calls himself a technically he describes himself as a lapsed marxist there is no such thing as a lapsed marxist it's a permanent it is, disease it, yeah, it's it a is, permanent disease yeah yeah it is as true as saying that uh, you know the sun is dark or something <laughs> it's as true as that there's no such thing as a lapse so that is the other thing these ideologues especially marxists they don't view themselves as human beings if i ask you what you are you know in an introduction you don't describe yourself by by your ideology <laughs> At, at the most in an introductory meeting you will tell your name and then you'll say look i come from uh, whatever delhi or gujarat or you know surat or bangalore or bombay and then you'll see maybe you'll say where you live or what what where you're working this is a normal conversation you talk to a marxist they will use these you know convoluted terms i am not a upper caste brahmin patriarch i am a lapsed marxist i am a ex socialist uh i am a kantian something i am a hegelian something this is normal conversation within the comrade circles for the longest time <laughs> i think the word normal itself has taken a beating so that is how you know like i said every ism is a prison they live in that prison and they want to convert the whole world into that prison and they believe that prison is utopia yeah okay. prison is utopia perfectly said so and all all their history writing everything is geared towards making entire generations making entire nations you know as prisoners this is what they have done and any anyway, anyway coming back to the names that i have taken hmm. we will uh, you know look at their uh, kundali in the next episode but i think this this episode sets the tone uh, giving the foundation for the kind of things that they have done because in this episode i've described their motivations yes their much you know, needed much yeah, needed yeah yeah their 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 uh, uh, you know their uh, the foundations of their ideology their methods you know like arun shauri famously said 
you know, you must thank that brilliant man for his service in exposing these people like nobody has done. It's classic book, eminent historians, eminent historians yeah. their technology, their line, their fraud. Uh, I mean, that's that's nothing short of national service that he has done. Absolutely. And there he details out all these things. Perhaps, you know, we'll uh, uh, bring out some of those, read it directly, some of the distortions from uh, his book. I mean, it is it is chilling. When you read that, it is chilling what all they got away for so long. And remember, after destroying two and a half, three generations, not one Marxist historian, alleged historian, has been punished till date. This kind of Marxist history distortion was directly responsible for the fall of the disputed structure in Ayodhya. So, uh, yes, I think uh, the audience also has been asking mm. for you to get into mm. some of the names uh, mm. that are now known for the nefarious yes, yes, uh, yes. past. Mm. So, I think your insights on those would be much necessary in the next conversation. Yes, yes. So, I am tempted to ask two things uh, right now as we wrap up this part. One is uh, that communism virtually has been wiped off from the planet. Hmm. And correct me if I am wrong, the only surviving so-called commie regime now is Kerala. Is there any other commie regime? China. Yeah, China. Okay, China is also... Namesake communist. Name, namesake communist. Hmm. So, uh, we'll talk about some of that in the, in hmm. the ne next part. And also in terms of uh, once the stranglehold of commies... Uh, as, as they are popularly called, starts to dissipate as it started to happen uh, over narratives. Mm. Hopefully, the future generations of children are safe and they are not cannon fodder. Mm. Would you see the NEP playing a role in that reversal? Or there, there, there is much more that needs to be done at a societal level, at a government level mm. to uh, make sure that there is no further damage done to future generations beyond the new education. A wonderful policy. question actually. Uh, this brings me back uh, to what I said. The short term damage that the communists have done by distorting and uh, you know mauling history has been enormous. So, the students who were taught under say an Irfan Habib or a Romila Thapar or a R.S. Sharma, they have gone on to take on different careers. They have become, some of them have become lawyers, bureaucrats, judges. Um, some of them have become academics, they have infiltrated, they have become journalists, editors. That is a damage. Now, their stranglehold, their worldview, whatever their opinions and their columns or, you know, their general outlook towards life and society and current affairs is still shaped by this early education that they have had. The actually communist education that they have received, alright? One. Two, while communism as a political ideology uh, has lost state power, that is political power, it has, the one thing that commies are good at, uh, the left, you know, speaking in a very broad sense, one thing the left is good is its ability to reinvent itself. Now, when Communism collapsed in USSR after the fall of Berlin Wall and then after Gorbachev kind of, you know, destroyed communist communism in Russia. After that, there was a lull. But something else was also happening in the same period. They might have lost uh, political power in, you know, their uh, the only fatherland, as uh, Arun Chauri mm. memorably puts it, USSR. That was only fatherland. So, money flow used to come directly, patronage used to come directly from Russia to various countries uh, in India, I mean in, in the world, uh, bo mostly non-communist countries in the world. Now once that money supply was cut off, something else was also happening. The u universities across Europe and US had already been infiltrated by leftists from uh, pre-war Europe who had moved most notably to uh, University of Chicago. Okay. So, most of the damage, the leftist narrative that you see coming from the US comes from US Chicago primarily. Oh, it starts from... The no. University of Chicago primarily. 
and then Columbia. Tentacles are far and wide. Yeah. Then you see Berkeley much later. Ah, and we are seeing some of that now. We are seeing this. So, you have to understand these things in this fashion. They might not have political power. The ideological grip is very strong. Now, how did this woke, so-called woke culture, it's not culture, woke is not culture. It, it is not, yeah. Woke is the absence of culture. Yeah, I think that's the way to label it. It's time, woke culture itself Woke is, is the absence of culture. Yeah, it's denigrating culture as a word. All right. So, how did this come about? It came about through, again, the capture of universities. So, therefore, no, this is worrying then. So, you're saying that exactly my they, point. they will keep they morphing will keep themselves, morphing themselves. A, and finding pa new paths yes. to continue yeah. their nefarious yeah. designs. Yeah. So, this has to, okay, this needs a larger discussion. It needs a larger discussion. So, that is what we should guard ourselves against. They might not have, you know, that kind of institutional clout anymore in, say, ICHR and educational ministry and other places. But like I said, they already have your children. I mean, and if you go by what is coming out from some of the universities you mentioned, yeah. they've got their children. They've got the children. They've captured them. What do you mean to say, and you know, there are several outraged parents demonstrating over the last uh, seven to eight years. What do you mean that children as young as five, six, seven years old, <coughs> their teachers are teaching them how to masturbate with graphic drawings? A lot of outraged parents were protesting, you know, it led to, led to a huge outcry in the US and, and, and even in England. Even by their standards. Yeah, even by outraged. their standards. Such a permissive society, but still. And, and this whole disease about he, him, her, she. Ah, see, that, children are saying you can't name us yeah, what without you, our consent. Boss, what, what, how can you decide my gender? What do you mean 72 pronouns, man? <laughs> it's a disease. See, I called you a man, so you should be offended. Children saying Children, parents yeah. can't determine the gender. Yeah. Neither can they name so the child. So, this is statism. Statism. Okay. This is what you are seeing there. Is statism in action. In which the actual state which wields political power is powerless against these people. A worrying. Very worrying. This is what left does. And you know what? It might be, you know, uh, it might surprise you to learn that this is this is nothing new. This experiment had already uh, already been tried more than a century back in Austria. Oh, this is there lab was, tested, so to yes, speak. Yes, lab tested. There was a Austria or Hungary, one of those countries. There was a communist revolution, a short-lived communist <coughs> government in Austria. I think in the twenties or or tw late twenties or early twenties, uh, a short-lived communist government in which the Commissar for Education had introduced sex, compulsory sex education in, in, in kindergarten. In kindergarten? In kindergarten. So, the society back then was strong. So, then, then, then that government fell and, you know, rest is history. But they have this institutional memory. Now, they have captured all these uh, centers for higher education through the back door systematically. And it is succeeding wildly. This is not, like I said, Parag, this is not just about historical distortion. No, this is spreading complete anarchy. Yes, it is. The US actually now yes. stands at yeah. a brink yeah. of uh, brink of anarchy. Brink of anarchy. Yeah. Was it? It was unthinkable even 10 years back to see the so-called founding fathers of America, their statues are being burnt and uprooted and vandalized. And the, some of the images that come out mm. of public mm. behavior. Yeah. How is this different? From say, in fact, this appears more worrisome. And scary. Yeah, it is. It is. How is in in its fundamental nature? How is this different from a U R Anant Murthy, who once publicly declared that he urinated on a Shivalinga near a you know a, you know on a highway, and that he got no curse or nothing bad happened to him. The destruction of sanctity, the destruction of everything that you hold. Self-evident to be moral, ethical, decent. These are the roots. And the path to achieve, to create a completely degenerate society which leads to anarchy is through the destruction of history. 
So the rest, I mean, I think we've digressed. Yes, we've digressed. But, but I think these the are all related note, point. And on the disturbing note, I think let's uh, hmm. let's pause here. Yes. Yeah, but uh, I think now this has triggered further thoughts. Yeah. And hopefully we can find time to cover those uh, once we're done with this uh, series on history. Hmm. Um, okay, I'm trying to regain my composure <laughs> as, I, as I wind this up. So thank you, Sandeep. I can't think of any other uh, way to describe the concluding part. But on that disturbing note, when Sandeep spoke about how it has, communism has the ability to reinvent and morph itself going back all the way to the University of Chicago and we're seeing the outpouring of that. I think uh, on that disturbing note, but an important note, I think we'll uh, pause this part, the fourth episode of the series on destruction of history by Marxists. And we'll come back again uh, soon with Sandeep and where he will take us through some of the names that all of you have been talking about, Romil Thapar, Irfan Habib, and a few others who, as Sandeep again very uh, painfully said, they got our children and how uh, they got our children, how they distorted history and with particular tribute and uh, to the good work that uh, the eminent uh, Arun Shauri has done, we'll, we'll refer to that as well like Sandeep mentioned and uh, we'll take it from there. So thank you all for joining us again and we look forward to having you back uh, for the next part. So in the meantime, please like, share and subscribe to Dharma Dispatch so that these conversations, these insights from Sandeep reach a wider audience. And thank you again for your time and attention.